gummy bear. It's the internet. You're busy. Let's do this. Welcome to for the next. <laughs> I was about to do my intro for my other show for the next hour or so. Let me help you sort through the world of gaming on Game Mess Mornings Live with me, Jeff Grubb. Uh, today I gaze long into the news hole, and the news hole also gazes long into me. But first, join me in welcoming today's co-host to Game Mess Mornings. It's Rachel Kayser from Games Beat, the Kayser Beam herself. How's it going, Rachel? Um, actually, not too bad this morning. I've, you know, had a nice glass of water. I had a nice breakfast. So at least for this morning, we're not talking about the rest of the weekend, but for this morning, things Absolutely. are all right. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I couldn't sleep last night. I ended up, wa started watching a show. It was a poor, poor decisions were made, but, uh, you know, whatever. I, I feel pretty good. I woke up this morning and it's nice to have this routine of like, okay, let's not, let's gather up the news. I was kind of looking at stuff over the weekend, but it's nice to have that routine to be like, okay, I could sit down for an hour, an hour and a half to make sure that I have everything sort of uh, sorted into this document that we didn't use for the show. Uh, and it kind of feels like, okay, yeah, now I have my day planned out. I can go do a show and accomplish something. And then, you know, the rest of the day I can work on other stuff. It's, uh, it's, it's nice to sort of have that structure for me. Uh, but then, yeah, I, I also had a pretty good morning. I, can I ask though, you know, we, we can talk about it when you're dealing with a rough weekend or, or like real life events, like do you end up just trying to get, like, I know we were talking before the show, you said like you were diving into some games. Is that kind of what your go-to strategy usually is? Because that is what works for me. And, and like, you, like you were saying, retro games, older games, comfort games yeah. is what works for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you just take the games that are like, you know, the warm blanket. You just pull them over your shoulders and you're like, I'm not facing anything right now. I need to like for my own mental health. I need to just retreat into my little cocoon, you know, just pull my blanket over my head. In my case, I think it's either. Um, well, I think my uh, 3DS is missing over there because I left it over in, in another room while I was playing. I think it was probably Ace Attorney, one of the Ace Attorney games that and uh, probably some of the Nancy Drew games. So I can just reminisce about playing those with my mom back in the day. Yeah. But yeah, comfort comfort games for sure. So I want to be able to tell you, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, I finished Neon White this weekend. And, you know, oh yeah, I was playing so much TMNT, but, you know, I would be lying to you <laughs> if I said that. Like, no, 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 let's, let's go back to our childhood days and just try to pretend things are all right for a yeah. while. I, uh, I retweeted it, but the... Um... Uh, Knubel, uh who posts some news onto uh, Twitter every once in a while, uh, he, he's like, people will replay this level a million times instead of going to therapy, and it's one of the <laughs> neon white levels that I've literally played a million times. So I'm like, yep, he got me. You nailed it. That's me. It's true. Yeah, it's true. Absolutely. Although uh, your uh, Nancy Drew ones uh, reminded me that I need to go back and replay some of the early FMV Sherlock Holmes games that I first played on PC when I was a kid. Ooh. I have not played those yes. since. And I'm like really dying to go back and, and play some of those. So I'll probably end up doing that. Old okay. school mystery adventure games. Just there's yeah. something about them. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I realize that like uh, the um, murder mystery investigation genre is something that I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm super into this uh, ever since too. What's the one on the ship? Um, uh, the one where you were like going back through time using the watch and stuff. I can't remember the name of oh, it. Oh, uh, uh, Return of the Oberdin. Yeah, Return of the Oberdin. I was going to the Lucas mm -hmm. Pope game. Yes. Uh Ever since then, I'm like, man, I need a million more of these games. And I'm like, it really yeah. doesn't have to be as clever as Obra Dinn. I maybe just want to be investigating murder in games. So uh, that's why I'm so excited about Pentiment from Josh Sawyer. It just is a murder mystery yeah, yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm ready yeah, for that, it. Yeah, that looks so, that looks so, I love the art style too. And I'm, too. you know, I'm, I'm into it. Yeah. Okay, before we get into this mess, let's explain ourselves. Uh, each day, I, Jeff Grubb, will help piece your gaming life back together. That includes breaking news, the catch-up, where we discuss the biggest topics consuming the lives of gamers everywhere, and maybe even bring some of our own original reporting, which we have a tidbit of today. We got a, a few things to talk about today. Uh, for all these topics, I'll get input from a bona fide expert who will make me look smart. If you are watching live on Twitch, welcome. I really appreciate that. You can always listen to the show later, however, on podcast feeds by searching for Game Mess Mornings or, or find the RSS on GiantBomb.com. Uh, to that to that point, we know it still says Grub Snacks on a lot of in a lot of places. I think anywhere that's getting its data from Apple still says Grub Snacks. We're working on updating that. Um, and uh, Tim Apple, if you're listening, just fix it. Just fix it yourself. Uh, you can also catch the show later with chapters and timestamps on uh, timestamps on YouTube. If you are watching on there, please be sure to hit that like button. It helps people find the show. Okay, uh, we have a lot to get into, so let's start the morning mess. 
I want to talk about Nintendo, Rachel. Uh, this yes. is uh, a, a story from Eddie McCoo at GameSpot. Nintendo Direct Mini coming tomorrow, focused on third-party games. Uh, from Eddie, he writes, Nintendo is hosting another Nintendo Direct briefing this week, and it will be a focus on third-party games. The mini broadcast will contain about 25 minutes of information on upcoming third-party Switch games. The event begins Tuesday, June 27th at 6 a.m. Pacific time, 9 a.m. Eastern, and can be streamed in all the usual places like YouTube and Twitch. You can also watch the event on GameSpot. So tune in. We haven't talked to Giant Bomb yet about whether or not we're going to talk over this. It seems pretty early. It's a mini, uh, but I, I would like to. So may maybe I'll just say that, and that'll force everyone else's hands, and uh, I could just make it I'll happen. I'll do it. Yeah, you just, I'll, I'll get it. Rachel on here to help me. Uh, uh, let's. Okay, so f first... I mean, I have more to say about this. We'll get to in, get into that in a second, Rachel. But uh, just a mini direct focused on third party games. Uh, what's your excitement level for that? Um, I was probably you know on a scale of one to ten, like six or seven, I would say. Okay. And I want I, I want to like if things that I suspect are going to be there are there, then oh yeah, we're talking like maybe an eight or nine. But it's like you know what you know already, Jeff. What I want to be there in terms of like upcoming Nintendo games. Oh, but yeah. I have a feeling based on how they worded that, yes. that it's not necessarily going to be there. Right. So, so. okay. So let, let, no, let's get into that then. So yes. you are, a, I'm just going to say it. You're a Bayonetta pervert. You're a Bayonetta freak. I am. And, and yes. so, and you, but, but they're clearly saying this is about third party. And I do not think this is one of those instances where it's like, we're going to be talking about games coming in the next six months. And then they reveal a game coming in like 2030 or something like that. No. Uh, uh, a, a, this is much more in line, and, and Eddie writes in his story how we talked previously on, on Game Mess Mornings and other shows about Nintendo will, wasn't going to do a big E3 showcase and instead was going to do a series of smaller events. Like I, I was saying this in early June, and I wasn't positive that that was going to be the case. So I was like trying to say, hey, this is what I'm hearing. I think people should probably hear this because I think it's right. I, it turns out this seems like this is exactly what's happening. And to me, that means we are going to get something focused on Nintendo games here in, in the very near future. Um, uh, it, and I think it's going to happen in July, but I don't, I don't know for sure about that. And the reason for that, the reason for that is they have other things to announce, like Bayonetta 3's mm -hmm. release date, right? We got, they got to give us a date on that. They haven't. Now, they could do that in a tweet. They could do it in a YouTube video. But I, I think they'll probably have enough to put together for maybe another mini direct focus on Nintendo games. Uh uh, to to that end, um, I could say that I've been told pretty definitively that Metroid Prime is going to be Metroid Prime Remastered is going to be one of their big holiday games. Like uh, in the past, this is something I heard was in the works. They have things happening with that game. Now it's like I've been told that their plans are to release the, that game th this holiday. I think almost certainly to line up with the 20th anniversary in November. Uh, so that is it's, that's happening, and they need to tell us when that release date is. Uh, is that something that do you think okay, this is where I'm at with the Nintendo Direct in July though because that's a remaster Bayonetta 3 needs its release date and there's a bunch of other things kind of similar to that Advance Wars needs its new release date um, oh yeah yeah w these are the kinds of things like they need to talk about that don't feel like they rise to the occasion of a full blown like traditional Direct D does that sound right to you like maybe they'll just do another mini focused on their upcoming games yeah I think so I think based on um the way you've described it. I honestly don't know, even if you combine the two mini directs, I don't think it would necessarily yeah. still make a big traditional direct. So it makes sense if, you know, like here's a, here's like a, a small cheesecake slice of, sorry, I'm a little hungry this morning. Um, <laughs> Me too. Here's a, Here's a small slice of what we're working on that happens to be like, um, that's what it has in common is that these are all third party partner games. And eventually, you know, we're, you know, just give us a couple weeks or, you know, assuming it's in July. And when we're ready, we'll be like, yes, here's a, here's another little slice. And, you know, it just doesn't sound like from the way they're setting this up that even if they combined them, it doesn't sound like even then it would still be a full direct. So I think it's better to have two mini directs that impress than one big direct that isn't actually that big yeah and i think that um you know they have things that they, they need to accomplish in terms of giving us you know dates and things like that but you know the big thing that was right ahead of them was you know blade chronicles 3 they gave us a big direct focus just on that and and now it's like a bunch of smaller release dates i also think they need to um uh begin like slightly paving the road for metroid prime 4 and to me metroid prime remastered seems like it is going to be exactly that now uh, Metro Prime Remastered is just Metro Prime One, 
that's the thing, that's the game that's coming this holiday. Um, but I still think that 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 game would be designed in a way by Retro Studios, who's also making Metroid Prime Four, so that they can communicate to fans what to expect for Metroid Prime Four, or like to get people used to things that might change. Um, I think that probably includes dual analog controls, so that um, that's you know that's not the way Metroid Prime originally controlled. They will probably be adding that so that things like the um, uh, so you can take advantage of the dual analogs, obviously. But also, I think they might be adding stuff like motion controls, gyro aiming, and things like that. And I think they're like, okay, let's put up Metroid Prime 1, a game that we know is beloved. Uh, let fans get used to this so that when Metroid Prime 4 comes along, people are just ready uh, ready to go. Uh, I, I think this begs the question, though, what about Metroid Prime 2 and 3? Well, mm -hmm. th the, other, the other scoop here is that those games are also coming. They're also pretty much done, it sounds like. But Nintendo being Nintendo is going to hold on to them and will likely drop them later uh, along the road. Uh, the, you know, how, however Nintendo decides in what order to release their games, they, they are going to do that, but they're gonna do it separately, it sounds like. Uh, and Metroid Prime 1, my understanding is that's getting like the big remaster treatment, and then Metroid Prime right. 2 and Metroid Prime 3 are sort of getting, they'll probably get like the updated controls and things like that, but they're not getting quite the same overhaul that Metroid Prime 1 is getting. It, it, Overall, mm -hmm. how, how does all that sound to you? Are you excited about what they're doing with Metroid Prime? Yeah, I, do, I think it's worth mentioning that, uh, you know, there is a whole generation of um, teenage to adult gamers who would not have been old enough to have played the original Metroid Prime trilogy. Yes. So there's also an element of getting the new generation in on it as well. And from that perspective, it does sound smart to me, although there is... You know, my my inner goblin is like, no, I want all Metroid Prime at once, please. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Same here. And also, like, also it's like, OK, uh, that to me, having Metroid Prime one remastered coming this holiday, two and three getting sprinkled along the road between Metroid Prime one and four tells me that four is probably still a pretty long yeah. ways off. Right. We're, we're going to get yeah. one, two, three over the course of months, maybe a year and a half or something like that. Like, who knows? Like. But it does seem like they're doing this as a way to have a, a long ramp up to Metroid Prime 4, which, you know, fine, that's cool. At least there will be Metroid stuff mm -hmm. coming out. I'm excited about that. Um, but it also just is a reminder that Metroid Prime 4 is, is a pretty long ways off. Um, so then th that brings us back around to, to that direct in uh, July. I, I don't know what else to really expect from there. I think it's going to be... The reason I think it's a mini is because it probably is going to be talking about a lot of those other things. And we're probably not going to get like the new game from the Mario team and things like that. They have a lot right. of they have a lot of games already announced that they need to get out still. Metroid Prime 4 and Breath of the Wild 2 being you know key among them. They're probably not going to announce another main huge game that they need to be talking about frequently uh, until they get those out. So a lot of this stuff lines up. And if they if they had a big direct in them, wouldn't they have done it in early June like they have in the yeah. past years? Like, doesn't that make sense? It, I think so, yeah. And I, I, oh, well, I wouldn't want to necessarily compete with, like, say, if the summer games thing were like one big cohesive whole, then maybe Nintendo wouldn't want to compete with it. But let's be real, it's been a bunch of like piecemeal shows for right. this entire year. So it was Nintendo. You know, if Nintendo had a big direct, it would be their show to lose. Right. Uh, this is uh, another story. Let's uh, let's move on. Uh, we'll go if we have anything else to say about that. Maybe we'll wrap up back around at the end. But. Uh, it pretty much covers what I wanted to talk about with Nintendo so far. Um, I, I suppose, well, you know what? Let's just roll. The, the third party showcase. Do you think we get stuff like Persona announced for the Switch? And that's why we didn't get it in the last thing. So, because they're going to, or they haven't announced it yet. Like, is Persona going to finally come to the Switch? I, I see you laughing. I'm and sorry, you're so right. Just, no, you're so right. Yeah. Do, do you think um, it happens? I, I hope for the, you know, for, for the meme, if nothing else. Right. Yeah, I'm 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 hopeful for that as well. Um, I was uh, bouncing around trying to like get more details about this stuff, and that seems to be the common accepted wisdom among people who are uh, in the know about these things. Usually, and I I can't confirm it myself, but uh, that's why I'm hopeful that that the, the you know the people who know the know about these things are right. Um, and then uh, what's the? I think maybe this is where Goldeneye finally shows up, uh, but. I also think there's a very, very strong chance that Nintendo and Microsoft, and Nintendo and or Microsoft, are still concerned about the war in Ukraine and the Russian content in that game. Uh, we know yeah. we. I mean, I don't. At this point, everyone knows that game is a real thing. The, the achievements are on Xbox, and they just popped up, you know, a few weeks ago. Like you could have just gone to see them on like through your Xbox or whatever. 
Um, mm-hmm. But I think that we, we just while it makes sense for that game to line up with its anniversary next month, I, I think that would be great. I also think there's a really good chance that they're just going to keep holding it until they feel more comfortable about the war. Now, um, you know, you could look at Google Trends and know that pe- like Americans have stopped Googling about Ukraine and Russia to the point where like those trends are back before, like below where they were before the war. Um, but is that is Nintendo and Microsoft going to let that be what dictates it, or are they going to try to be still be like you know respectful of what's actually happening on the ground? I bet both companies would be, especially as they are working with each other and they don't want to make the other one look bad. They're going to mm-hmm. lean toward like trying to be respectful of what is actually happening on the ground. Is, is does that sound right? I think that if I mean if it, if it is Goldeneye, then I do think there's enough of it. That there's enough juice to Goldeneye that you don't necessarily have to yeah. release it right on the anniversary. You can you know wait however long and release it again. It's not gonna. I don't think it's really gonna have a huge effect on the sales at all. I agree. And I think I think I hope good taste prevails here. Put it that way. Yes, exactly. And I think that's probably what is going to happen. Uh. All right, the next story here, Horizon 2074 has basically been confirmed as the name of the Horizon TV show by the Directors Guild of Canada, Ontario. Uh, I, You know what, let me see if I can find, here it is. Okay, let me put it over here in the thing. Let me go to news assets and let's go ahead and look here. We'll just scroll through this, let me transition. So as you can see here, this is the Directors Guild of Canada, Ontario website. As far as I can tell, no one else like posted this news story. It's been up all weekend. Um, Horizon 2074, and it's kind of cut off there, but uh, you guys get the idea. Uh, this mm-hmm. is this is the the crew that is going to be working on the show. It has been announced. Uh, like I said, it's going to be it's going to take place in Toronto, and they're filming it in Toronto. And there's the name uh, Horizon 2074, and as the name suggests, it will take place. Uh, in a way that they can illustrate what happened in the, during the fall of that world before it became the Horizon Zero Dawn that we saw in the games. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that it's um, also worth pointing out that this is a an existing like production crew in a way that doesn't normally happen on TV shows. Um, and most of the time, TV shows like they just like they hire like a, a production company, and that production company then brings in a whole new crew. This almost almost this entire crew was the the crew that was working on Lock and Key for Netflix, a show about locks and keys, I guess. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they, they, they just went basically, okay. yeah, they finished that show for Netflix and they wanted to stay together because it enables them to get off the ground faster. They know everyone works together well and they are just going right into working on Horizon 2074. So uh, yeah, I, I, where, where are you at with the Horizon games and the story and wanting a TV show? Um, I think there's... As with any intellectual property worth its salt, it's like, yeah, you could definitely tell stories in this universe that are not covered by the games. I, I, I'm I, kind of in like a sort of Last of Us position where I'm like, is it really worth it to try and remake the game's story into a show? Yes. Um, I don't think that's, ex- but that doesn't seem to be what they're, what they're going for here. If the title, I'm assuming the title is like where it takes place and not when it's going to be released. <laughs> yes. But, <laughs> Man, hope, but yeah, I'm not... not. I'm I'm not here for as just a cinematic retelling of Aloy's story frame by frame, you know. And there is a lot of material there that the game characters are not privy to about what happened during the apocalypse, basically. Right. And but what worries me is that the things that everyone remembers about Horizon are basically robot dinosaurs mm-hmm. um, in in a, a, a primitive world. And that's, if you set it in that time period, that's not what people are going to see necessarily. So I'm worried we're going to lose a little bit of the game's visual, sure. uh, the, the visual similarity to the games. But there are, there are ways of getting around that. Well, yeah, and that's one of the things I've heard is that while it's called Horizon 2074, and it's definitely about the story, the story of how this world went from like, you know, the peak of civilization to falling, um, that it would be split somewhat among the um, 2074 timeline and then the game timeline. And it mm-hmm. it's not gonna try to retell that story, but it's gonna maybe show the the consequences of the actions that's happened in 2074. Maybe every episode you'll get a, like a, a couple of cuts to what is happening in the uh, the future world or whatever, the, the far future world. So to me, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Like they're not trying to, reboot, requel, whatever it's called, the games. They're not trying to just like shove Aloy into a TV show. Um, they are building on this story that they were already telling in a way that makes sense for TV and provides like a, a good, like 
you know, you could you could try to set a game in uh, 2074 uh, for Horizon, but then that ends up feeling like whenever you go to the like the the, the present day time in Assassin's Creed, right? Like you're not like mm-hmm. this weird person in an office. Although the the, the Assassin's Creed where you were in the office is actually the best one, or, or at least right. the best time when you went to the past. But still, it's like it's weird, it's funky, it's not what people come to those games for. So you have the opportunity to make a TV show. You're you're Sony, like this is one of your core competencies. Why not look for the angle for that story to uh, best uh, explore that world? And here we are with a show that I think makes a lot of sense. And you're not the only one I've heard say they wanted a Horizon show to not just retell Aloy's story. That seems to be the Mm -hmm. common wisdom among fans that that's what they want. I just thought of something. I just thought of something. So Lance Reddick in the game is basically Lance Reddick in real life. Yes. So if they wanted to, if they wanted to make, uh, they wanted to go to the game timeline, he seems like the perfect um, game, like the game character who can most easily cross over into a live action show. Yes. And it just occurred to me, it's like, oh, if you want to have something from the game timeline, he seems like the easiest that's you know element really to point. port over. Yes, and I, so, he, he would be down. Like he loves games. He like. Mm-hmm. He, wants to be in these games and he wants to be a part of this like i think he would be the ideal face of of this show and be like yes mm-hmm. we're gonna like check in on him and his character in the future uh while we also have like you know the lineage that goes back to the past and you know the, i don't really know the horizon story all that well and may, maybe some of this is spoilers but there's opportunities to reuse those characters in both timelines right or the both uh, yeah. both parts of the time so yeah uh I, you could do a lot with that and I suppose we're going to see it because uh, this show's moving along. They have a crew. They're going to start filming here pretty soon, it sounds like. So that's uh, exciting. Uh, also exciting, John Cena reportedly urged Nintendo to make a new 2D Metroid game in 2017. This is by Jordan Midler at Video Game Chronicles. Uh, Video Games Chronicle. I think that's actually right. I've been getting better about uh, remembering how to actually say that website. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's see here. I, I have this uh, tweet here from uh, some character on the internet uh, I believe his name is Dan, Don Reich, Dan Reichard. Uh, he said during this photo shoot in 2017, Cena reportedly told the Nintendo reps how much he wanted a new 2D Metroid. When Metroid Dread came out years later, he was sent a copy. Cena's people sent an email back saying John loves it. Uh, former Nintendo staff member, Krista Yang, and this is now, this is by uh, Jordan Midler over at VGC. We've got a pretty heavy Jordan day, so thanks, Jordan. Um, Krista Yang, who worked as part of Nintendo's editorial team at the time, corroborated the story, saying he did say how much of a Metroid fan he was. He's a really nice guy. Uh, the image of Cena from the event, which has become a meme at the time due to the fact that it appears his uh, his shoes are melting into the carpet, <laughs> was part of the Nintendo Switch in a, in Unexpected Places campaign that Nintendo ran in the run-up to the launch of the Switch in 2017. And if you're listening to the audio version, this is just a picture of John Cena sitting in a cube holding a Nintendo Switch Pro controller. Uh, I love this picture more than most things. I'm uh, happy to hear that he got his Metroid game and that he's one of us, Rachel. He's one of the Metroid fans, you know? one of the almost yeah. 3 million of us out there that buy those games still. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't necessarily think that John Cena saying, hey, I want another new 2D Metroid game is what motivated Nintendo sure. to do it. Sure, but, but it probably it didn't was. hurt. It didn't hurt, right? If John Cena tells you to do something, like, like you'll exactly. probably listen to him, right? I would listen to him. He's like, Jeff, yeah. stop eating so much uh, of those little Lindo, Lindo chocolate balls that you keep in your fridge. I'm like, all right, John. I'll consider it like that works for me. That's motivation. Uh, maybe it worked for Nintendo as well, but I think you're probably like more like more right that someone just ended up making this game and that he was a beneficiary of, uh, of, uh, of good timing to be able to get a game a few years later. I'm glad he liked it though. I also yeah, like yeah. Metroid Dread quite a bit. Um, I kind of wish, I kind of wish he had responded personally. They're like, Oh yeah, John loves it. And I'm like, John, get on Twitter, post images of yourself, stream it on, Twi- stream it on Twitch, John. Come on. I want to see you play Metroid Dread. Right. I, uh, yeah. So like, you know, wrestling, uh, notorious for like what's real, what's not. Uh, I think in this instance, we can, uh, r- reliably believe that John Cena means what he says when it comes to Metroid and that he really does like, it. I, it's like, even like when people like famous people, wrestlers, whatever, like video games, very rarely is Metroid the series that they're going to like say, oh, that's one of my favorites. So uh, I think John Cena might be a real one is what I'm trying to say. And that's very exciting. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, this story, we'll just read it. Miyamoto initially cringed at Wind Waker's art style 
and asked for a redesign. This is by Jordan Midler at VGC. According to translations of old magazine interviews published by Did You Know Gaming, Nintendo initially planned to simply improve on the graphics from Ocarina of, uh, or Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask and even created a prototype of the Wind Waker in that style. According to translations of old magazine interviews published by Did You Know Game... Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, this new information comes courtesy of old issues of Nintendo Dream Magazine, a Japanese publication from the mid-2000s that has been uh, since been translated by Did You Know Gaming. According to an interview with Wind Waker director E.I.G. Awanuma, uh, cited by the video, he didn't believe Miyamoto would like the redesign, so he waited as long as he could before showing it to his boss, saying that he, that Miyamoto, literally cringed when he first saw it. If I had gone and talked to him from the beginning, I think he would have said, how is that Zelda, Awanuma recalls. Miyamoto had trouble letting go of the realistic Link art style until the very end. At some point, we, he had to give a presentation against his will. That's when he said something to me like, you know, it's not too late to change course and make a realistic Zelda. So, okay. So Miyamoto is one of those. I think there was a poet named uh, uh, Jeff Gersman who said that uh, we need a Link who turns into a wolf and fucks. And that's the serious realistic Link that we need. Not, uh, not none of this Wind Waker stuff. And it turns out that Miyamoto was one of them all along. And we should have known. Uh, how betrayed do you feel, Rachel? Because I feel pretty betrayed. Wasn't that gamer's reaction at the time? I mean, I was a little bit younger, so I don't remember exactly as well, but I seem to recall everybody, a lot of people had that reaction when they saw Wind Waker's art style the first time. It does take a little bit of getting used to. Yes. So I'm not I'm not heartbroken. I'm not too betrayed. Although I feel like in retrospect, I feel like he would have been the first uh, Miyamoto, I should say, would be the first to tell you. It's like, yeah, that that ended up working out. Oh yes. I absolutely uh I, and uh, I know that Mike Minotti in the chat here is is uh, saying that he was famous for uh, loving it from the first instant he saw it. And I was like, I never hated it. And I was never one of those like, we this is uh, a travesty and we need to go back to something realistic. But I was like, okay, I need a second just to, uh, like you said, to like adapt to what I'm seeing. And then once I like really got into it, especially once I played it, uh, this is like one of those times where I learned... Um, seeing a game in a trailer on like, where was it? It was maybe it was like G4 at the time. I don't know. I was seeing on TV or whatever. Um, and I'm like, okay, this, I, this looks interesting. I like how the eyes move. Maybe I was watching like IGN 64.com back then. Uh, but it was like, uh, the, the eyes move that all the animation is really cool. The, the mo mo goblins or whatever, the goblins all looked really, uh, life like, full, full of life. And I like that, but it still took me a second. But as soon as I got my hands on the controller, it just clicked into place so hard for me. So uh, I guess, yeah, Miyamoto's only human. I suppose it's okay that he, uh, he needed a second as well. Um, but I'm glad that they ended up going with the cartoon style. Absolutely. This is true. Uh, next story, 505 Games acquires D3 Go, publisher of Marvel Puzzle Quest. This is by Rachel Kayser at GamesBeat. Uh, uh, don't, she's a hack. Don't listen <laughs> to her. Uh, she writes, 505 Games announced it has acquired mobile game publisher D3 Go. Or, or D3 Go! The exclamation point. Uh, the latter is best known as the company behind Marvel Puzzle Quest, among other games in the series. 505's parent company, Digital Bros, now owns Puzzle Quest's developer and publisher, having acquired the former Infinity Plus 2 in 2021. D3 Go's titles will continue to operate, with 505 supporting new content for each of them. While 505 did not disclose the terms of the deal, it did say that D3 Go's eight-person team will join 505's U.S. office in Calabasas, Calabasas. Uh, mm -hmm. 505 and Digital Bros are expanding their reach into the free-to-play space through their recent acquisitions. The company is currently expanding its portfolio with several titles in development, including Puzzle Quest 3 and Infinity Plus 2, or with Infinity Plus 2. Uh, oh, Mike's going to have my butt. I accidentally said in expanding twice in the same paragraph. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. Yeah, and, you, yeah, and I'm not going to let you go fix that now. You're going to have to let Mike fix it. I just, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that 505 Games um, uh, kind of like growing in all directions uh, sounds about right for the, that publisher. I think um, people talk about, oh, the consolidation of the industry. Uh, and this is definitely another example of that, but also it is an example of that from a smaller publisher where 505 games is maybe spotting an opportunity to grow into the gaps left behind by like th third party publishers, like Activision that might get absorbed into Microsoft. Um, and you know, there, there's going to be a chance for em the embracers of the world, 505 games of the world to fill in those spaces but to do that they need to be ready to grow pretty quickly and that means not just doing console games not just doing pc games but having a strong yeah. mobile strategy strategy as well right 
Yeah, especially something like Puzzle Quest, which is um, it's it's from what I've been able to tell, very profitable for its parent company. Right. So, and not just Marvel Puzzle Quest, but they've also got Puzzle Quest Three in development, which is also uh, coming out soon. I think it's in early access right now. Yes, that sounds right. I know people have been playing that. Were um, some some were enjoying it, and I think others were like, ah, the time has passed. But I mean, early access things could change. So, uh, but I I have heard people who were into Puzzle Quest Three for sure. So yeah, that's coming. Like, and this seems like a good way for them to generate revenue, a revenue base that they can rely on that enables them to continue to publish bigger and better games across all platforms. So it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see from Hideo Kojima. This uh, Hideo Kojima says he shelved the game con- game concept due to similarity to the boys. And this is by Jordan Midler at VGC. Uh, Hideo Kojima says he shelved the game concept due to similarity to the boys. Speaking on Twitter, the mind behind Metal Gear Solid and Death Stranding said that he put it on hold because the concept was similar uh, although it had different settings and tricks uh, to the Amazon show. It was a buddy like female slash male thing with a special detective squad facing off against legendary heroes behind the scenes. Kojima said, I was thinking of Mads Mikkelsen as the lead. Uh, For sure. And, yes. And now when he, when he talks about it that, that way, I bet that's, this is how he talks about video games. But I, I wonder mm-hmm. if there was a possibility if this was going to be like one of his uh, TV shows or movies that he was going to work on because he's also said he wanted to do that. Um, but are you at all surprised that like Kojima just has ideas like that, just rattling it around and then he sees a show and he's like, well, damn it. And he just scratches it off a list. <laughs> I will say, I don't think Kojima's concept would have been quite like the boys because the boys doesn't seem like his, uh, like his style. Yes. I think it would have been different enough that we, that both could have coexisted, but I do also understand when you're, you're coming up with a creative concept and somebody and almost immediately like life just turns around and says, oh yeah, they already did that. You're like, damn yeah. it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you know. I bet Kojima um, really likes how he often gets credited for being, uh, you know, clairvoyant and and first the first person to like discuss concepts, and he really likes researching things and and being like you know talking about nanobots before anything else is talking about nanobots and all that stuff. Uh, so I think if he sees something that he feels is is aping what he was going for, I bet that's like really deflating for him, and he wants to just he's like, no, I have a million other ideas. We'll just do one of those instead. So, uh, but I, I guess it's also just cool to like, okay, he does have this like list of ideas. Um, it's not just like one or two things he's working on at a time. It probably is a pretty lengthy list of stuff that he could be doing at any time. I will say that his concept, if it's like a buddy, a sort of buddy adventure with a detective squad that, I mean, from the way, I don't know if this is exactly, maybe I'm reading it too much into this, but it almost sounds like sort of like, forgive the expression, like almost like a muggle, like a uh, right. detective squad that polices superheroes, like keeps yeah. them in line, which honestly sounds dissimilar enough from the boys that I would, I actually really want him to really want him to do this. Right. Yeah. It's um like the, the boys is like a, a group of like regular humans trying to take down some meta humans, but it's for like revenge. It's not like any sort of, uh, I mean, I guess they are like hired by the government, but, but still like, yeah, you're right. There are ways to do that in different ways. And frankly, we've had like many stories similar to the boys before the boys, mm-hmm. but the execution being different enables those stories to tell different parts of that same concept. And I, I know that Kojima would be able to do that in a way that would be different, but yeah, still, I'm, I'm, I, I don't blame him for being like, well, no, can't do that now. We're still uh, on John Cena, by the way. Are we just going to leave him up there the entire time? Oh, thank time? you. Yes. You know what? We, I, I think I might just leave him on. up there. Oh, thank you yeah. for that. Let's, uh, yeah. uh, John let's Cena forever there. is what I say. There we go. Thank you so much, Rachel. Rachel. Uh, let's see. Uh, Skull and Bones will finally be re- re-revealed next month. Uh, next month, it's claimed by Andy Robinson at VGC. Uh, that's according to writer Tom Henderson, who claimed on tryhardguides.com that the publisher is planning to show gameplay and re-reveal details of the title's mechanics during the week of July 4th. If true, this would represent the latest indication that the long in development title could finally be approaching a release date. Over the past month, Skull and Bones has been rated by the boards in both Brazil and South Korea, su- suggesting that it could arrive during Ubisoft's cu- current fiscal year, ending March 2023, as planned. Uh, Rachel, since this story, um, and since like Tom like you know broke this on on uh, Tryhard Guides, uh, the ESRB has also now rated Skull and Bones. Uh, this game seems like it could just drop next month. Is that the sense you get? 
Oh, it's it's we need to get this game out of our system at this point, out of our collective gamer system at this point. How what what re reveal are we on now since it first was revealed like right. sometime right after Black Flag came out? Right. This feels like it would be like the third major re reveal, right? Um Yeah. And this one feels like the we are cutting off everything we don't need from this game, you know, putting it into shipping shape, which just means it's going to be uh, it'll have gameplay, it'll have mechanics, it'll have stuff to do, but it's not going to be some like long-term live project for, for Ubisoft. They are just going to put this game out and sort of let it die. Let it immediately sink because it's a game about ships. Um, I, I just, I, it's hard for me to have any excitement. I suppose like this is their opportunity to rebuild that excitement, but um, I, I don't know. I, I just, it, it feels like if this, this is a concept that made so much sense, just take, you know, Black Flag, make it its own thing, make it, make it its own game, add a whole bunch of other stuff to that, and and boom, you got a successful game. Um, why that concept has, uh, has floundered so long at Ubisoft, I don't know, and it must just be that they don't really believe in the vision of what it's turning into, and so why should I believe in, in it, you know? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it was, it was something that scuttled. That's the word I was thinking of <laughs> yes. for when you... Sc- that's right. what you do with ships. You scuttle them. That's but, what they're doing uh, here. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're scuttling it. So it, it no longer, it no longer serves, but you can't just, you can't, it doesn't just disappear. So you've got to get rid of it somehow. So yeah, just sort of shove it out there and uh, let it, let it live or die. I would actually, I'd actually be really, I, I almost want it to be a success just because right. that that would run so contrary to what everyone has predicted for it up until right. this point. I bet Ubisoft would be like, wait, now we have to like support it and should we make a sequel? Like, yeah, exactly. They would actually, <laughs> Ubisoft would immediately, if it was a success, they would. Oh, yeah. immediately yeah. They, would, they would do that. Uh, they made a Red Steel too, so come on. Um, I, I'll say that if the game, what I really want from this game is just like in someone in Chad Zombie Pie was saying, uh, reboot Sid Meier's Pirates again. I just want this game to be Black Flag meets Sid Meier's Pirates where I'm just sailing around the caribbean i am going from island to island i am uh um i am you know pirating ships i'm taking their goods mm-hmm. and then i'm finding the port to sell you know the the the, the cinnamon at the highest price possible and it's this, mm-hmm. this really in-depth e- economic simulator um to me that like that would just be fantastic if you combine the sailing of you know black flag with that stuff but uh you know who knows maybe we'll maybe that's exactly what it is and they're like this is only going to sell to one person we've put it through a computer and only jeff grubb cares about this i'll, I'll be happy i guess um all right to win. yes to win for me uh from software is working on multiple new projects from different directors uh this is uh by andy robinson once again from vgc uh Elden Ring developers, uh, developer from software is working on multiple new projects, it, it said. We talked about that last week. Uh, that's according to the Japanese studio's latest recruitment drive, which has it searching for staff to cover, in its words, a wide range of occupations for multiple new projects. Elden Ring director and from president Hidetaka Miyazaki elaborated on the comments in a Japanese 4Gamer interview on Friday, revealing that the in-development games were being helmed by different directors. As I have said in several interviews, the fact that we have been able to create a title of the scale of Elden Ring now is largely due to the expansion of staff within the company. But I think that from now on, we we will be entrusting more projects to them. In fact, we are working on several titles directed by people other than myself, he added. I think we'll be able to show you a different color of direction from From Software, uh, so please look forward to it. Um, I, I think this was always based on that story last week of them having um you know project nearing completion right now and um and then uh, you know they're the the, hidetaki miyazaki's working on his next game and there's other stuff coming as well i I, my understand was always that this was like other directors working on many of these projects uh but it sounds like they like this is like their strategy going forward is they want to expand in in such a way that miyazaki can still make his games but then there are many other people working on other things alongside that Uh, does that excite you Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I think from software, you know, they're they're at the peak right now, so they have a long way to fall. But I don't think they will. Right. I think I think they've proven well enough that they have enough of a stamp of quality that I think any they they would have to really fluff it in order to like put out something from them that is bad at this point. I don't, and I don't think they they want to do that. I don't think Miyazaki would would allow that to happen. I hope. Right. I, I, I think, you know, and I think that, um, like, if there are missteps along the way, that's possible. But that's part of the process of learning how to sort of let other people who aren't Miyazaki direct. Like, maybe there are ways to emulate the way he makes games with other people. But that means also entrusting other people to do things themselves. 
and maybe that means they, they end up putting a game that people feel like this is not a Miyazaki game. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. And if we want more of that in the future, maybe we need to figure out how to replicate that with other people, or maybe we need to be okay with, with going off in different directions, trying new things from people who aren't Miyazaki. Maybe that's more beneficial long-term because this is how we were, mm -hmm. we were talking about it last week, where it's like, you know, at a certain point, you need to begin building up the next generation. And and, and uh, Tam was saying, you know, Tam is a huge FromSoft fan. He's like, they are going to attract a lot of people who want to make games specifically because they played from software games. And they need to be able to attract that talent and, and sort of help them grow into positions of being able to make games with a From spirit, uh, but without being, you know, the original From yeah. Miyazaki team. And I, I think that's exactly the way to approach this. It's a good idea for long-term growth. Yeah, um, and Elden Ring is like, I mean, just just one last thought. I mean, no, Elden please. Ring is just so much so much like the big magnum opus that FromSoft has put out. It's the best it's the best game I I think that FromSoft has ever made. And I think at that point you you have you you are big enough at that point that you can sort of break things off into almost like more boutique projects. Right. And and, and dedicate the resources to them and cuz you know you, you've you you've you've done it. You've summited the mountain and yeah. now literally almost and so now you can now you have the freedom and the trust required to make sort of like this to, to make the smaller projects to make the more the, the the experimental stuff and from has a lot of like dance partners right like microsoft has reportedly wanted to work with them we know that sony has and probably will continue to work with them in the future you know on bloodborne things like that um uh, uh, uh not that's demon souls um and then Bandai Namco is not going to want to like let up on the deal either. So it's like multiple teams enabling Miyazaki to sort of like dip his fingers into a bunch of other stuff while mostly giving directorial control over to someone else enables them to maybe take on more of those big deals that could be big paydays for them, uh, let alone what, you know, however well those games end up selling. Like it could still be a, a good pathway for, for them to make a lot of money in the meantime while they are partnering, partnering with Microsoft, Sony, whoever and then they can also sell a lot and make a lot of money that way as well. Um, okay, uh, let's get to the catch up where we talk about big topics of the day, some stuff that like reminders about what's happening uh, and, and we have conversations about other things as well. Let's see, uh, I wanted to tell everybody that July's PlayStation Plus Essential Games, um, these are the games that like traditionally were just like, oh, you're gonna get these games with PlayStation Plus. They're still doing that. It's it's still on every tier, but uh, you know, even now the Essential tier. For July, it is Crash Bandicoot 4, the Dark Pictures, Man of Adon, and Arcadageddon. Uh, I meant to look up Arcadageddon. I think I remember seeing that game before and being slightly interested in it, uh, but now I can't remember. Uh, but Crash Bandicoot 4 and Man of Adon, I, I especially like Crash Bandicoot 4. That's my favorite Crash Bandicoot game. Do any of these stand out to you, Rachel? Yeah, Crash 4, definitely. And I might actually play Man of Medan if I can get it for right. free. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a coward, but these kinds of games, I've been meaning to get into... All of these, um, I, I can never remember the uh, super, what's the name of the developer? Uh, but, but either way, their games, their, their whole style thing, they just put out the quarry. I want to try to start getting into this because they seem like the kind of thing I could sit down with my wife or maybe just do it over with the Discord community and have us all decide on what to do next. I mean, they're adding multiplayer to the quarry here pretty soon. Uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. And then people have fun watching me, you know, squirm and scream and stuff. So it, it could be a good time. Uh, also, I wanted to, you know, an RIP here to Bernie Stoller, former SIG of America president and SCEA founder. Uh, he has died at age, uh, the age of 75. Uh, this, this comes from Dean Takashi at GameSpeed. Uh, video game legend Bernie Stoller, former president of SIG of America, has passed away at the age of 75, friends have said. Stoller became famous, uh, I, I, and Dean writes, I met him when he was president and chief operating officer of SIG of America where he helped lead the development and launch of the Sega Dreamcast. He was one of the more blunt and honest, uh, uh, and as well as memorable executives that I met in the gaming industry. Before that, Stoller was the first executive vice president and founding member of Sony Computer Entertainment America. He helped line up the original games for the launch of the original PlayStation. At Sony, he signed game franchises, including Crash Bandicoot, Ridge Racer, Oddworld Inhabitants, Spyro the Dragon, and Battle Arena Toshinden, uh, but he eventually exited that job. I loved working for Sony, Stoller told me in an interview. Again, again, this is Dean writing. I really did, but when the opportunity came up to go to Sega and help rebuild the business and come up with new hardware, I was very interested in doing it. I wouldn't have left Sony if I hadn't had also lived in fear of getting fired along with everyone else, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is, um, it's a bummer. He was 75. Uh, he definitely made his mark on the industry, 
Bernie Stoller is a name that I remember always coming up, like reading EGM and, and then like listening to to um, a podcast and people would talk about like the early 2000s and stuff like that and talk about uh, uh, Dreamcast and the days of that and talk about Bernie Stoller quite quite frequently. Um, and kind of, you know, founding Sony Computer Entertainment America, which has sort of become the uh, the, the, the the leading thing for Sony uh, when um, the, they moved from Japan, they moved their headquarters from Japan to America. Uh, that is the entity that now is basically PlayStation. Um, I, that is like, that, that's a legacy right there in gaming. And uh, I remember that, that launch lineup for the PlayStation is the thing that like really wowed me. I remember renting a PlayStation and uh, getting Battle Royale and Toshin Den and Ridge Racer and a few others. And yeah, uh, signing those games, that's that's the kind of thing that makes or break a system. And he definitely had his hand in making PlayStation. So uh, do you have a, do, Bernie Stoller, is that a name you were familiar with? Yeah, yeah, from, I mean, it's one of those names that, you know, sort of, like, is mentioned in the, uh, sort of, like, the hallowed, the hallowed halls, and, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, not, again, it's not that it's a, comes as a huge surprise, but at the same time, like, she hadn't gone. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I wish I could have met him. Yeah, me too. Uh, He seemed like, he seemed like a real cool guy. Uh, I wish I could have met him as well. Uh, all right, and then I want to talk about uh, a, a, an article I read uh, from a, a column called Kaiser Focus by Rachel Kaiser. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, you, that one again? Yes. <laughs> uh, so on, on Friday, you posted your column, I believe it was Friday, uh, where you talked about how overturning Roe versus Wade is going to affect the gaming industry. Obviously, it has effects across every aspect of life. Uh, but I thought like your uh, very pointed commentary about um, even if you think this doesn't affect you, if you work in games, it, it absolutely does. Um and it felt like a really good appeal to, I, I thought, to like, you know, this, the cynical business types who are just like, uh, I'm just here about to make money. Um, how do you, like, how would you broach this conversation with them? How would you explain uh, uh, overturning Roe versus Wade and how that would affect uh, uh, people who are just trying to make money? If that's really all they care about, why they mm-hmm. should still care about this? Well, I mean, first of all, everyone, yeah, we're going to talk about Roe v. Wade, so br- brace thyself, but... Yeah. yeah, I think it's it's going to have a knock on effect on every part of the economy for starters, because, mm-hmm. I mean, let's just let's just use myself as an example. I live in Texas, a state where abortion is now outlawed. And in fact, there is a bounty program to turn people in for having for even being associated with somebody who has had an abortion. And so let's let's put this into perspective here. If I were to become pregnant um, whether through my will or no, then that means I am now I now have to support a child uh, that I potentially didn't want. I will have to take maternity leave. I will have to um, this affects my career. It affects uh, my financial earnings. And, you know, having a child, it's not just uh, just just something that, you know, I've, I've heard so many times people tell women will take responsibility for yourself. It's like, well, excuse me, taking responsibility for myself means a huge drive up in public assistance for mm-hmm. starters. And I might not necessarily need that if I if that were to happen to me. But who's to say it yeah, wouldn't? I mean, especially in this economy right now. Right. So you have uh, a bunch of several women leaving the workforce. And like it or not, you don't have a workforce if you exclude half the population from it. Uh, people are going to be I mean, catastrophizing here but let's say that you're on a re- you're on a recruitment drive for a major game company um what do you think about you know if uh, if there was a woman for example a woman who lives in a state like mine would you be pr- possibly interested in hiring her knowing that she does not necessarily have access to that kind of health care yeah. somebody who you know if something unfortunate were to happen to her would have to carry a child for nine months right. and then even if you even if you don't have like if you even if you think you don't have those biases if you are if money's tight and you're trying to start up your company and you have yeah. to think like oh man this uh, a, a, a woman who's just starting her career and also might want to maybe uh you know like what if she does get pregnant and she doesn't have any chance to you know handle that how she wants to handle that uh I, I'm going to be stuck having to replace her and while, while she's off, you know, raising a kid for whatever. And uh, yeah, like it, subconsciously, this could get to people. Absolutely. Well, and it also presumes that a woman is, you know, of course, we're also a country that does not have a whole lot of uh, 
safeguards for women. You know, of course, this disproportionately affects, uh, you know, women who are uh, not high income, not from high income right. families, minorities, that sort of thing. And it's going to get even more. It just it dri- it drives the disparity. We have a wage gap. We have, um, you know, lack of ma- lack of paid maternity leave, lack of child care options, all of which combined means that women are going to be driven from the workforce. And so you you were going to have a we already have a talent shortage yes. in the games industry and now we're saying that we're going to deprive ourselves of talented female game creators even more so and again we're speaking in broad strokes here but I mean if we just if you shrink it down to just one company like say you're hiring for I don't know small eight person indie studio you have two job openings um, are you really going to you know they again people say they don't have these biases. But, you know, it's the sort of if, if we're talking about a money making and an economic prospect, I mean, we're talking about, you know, would you hire a woman who if she it, again, if she is raped, for example, and has to carry the baby to term, she could possibly be out of the workforce for several months. Um, you would she would have to probably require more medical care because we do also have a high maternal death rate in America. Right. So, yeah, there's there's just a lot of. There, there's a, there are going to be a lot of consequences to taking away a woman's right to choose to give birth to a baby. Right, and it's um, it extends the trauma in situations like that where it's like people mm-hmm. already relive their traumas, re- regardless if there are living reminders with them in their home. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. or, but you know, having to uh, maintain a pregnancy, especially in the case of a rape, uh, forces that trauma consistently for for a year or more. Uh, even if like they were to put up the kid for adoption or something like that, which is the thing that, you know, the the people, you know, against abortion always say, like, just do that. Uh, although they never adopt any kids. Um, it's like, and, and, and so it's situations like that. It's like, you are causing long-term, uh, pain to be even more painful, even to last even longer, which is going to have an effect on a person's ability to work. Um, and again, that might sound like, okay, well, you know, they can't work, but you know, the worst, worst things are happening here. But we're, we're talking, again, we're speaking to the cynical businessman here. This is who we're trying to reach out to in this specific instance. So, uh, yeah. Uh, obviously, um, my, my big thing with this, and we were talking at the start of the show about how uh, it's very easy to give into the despair, and you're, we're looking for ways to escape here or there. Mostly, I'll say that um, it really feels like no one's coming to help us uh, anytime soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have to do our best to, best to help each other. Um, cause yeah. And, and help, and help ourselves as best we can, uh, cause no one's coming to save us. So yeah, that's uh scary and frustrating. And, uh, and any instance we get a, t- a chance to talk to someone who could help in any way, um, we probably should be looking to have that conversation. So, uh, yeah, Rachel, this, this yeah. is, a, this is a case or focus. People can read this. Anything else to say? I just want to say that I do. <laughs> I appreciate that there are some game companies who are like, oh, yeah, if you have to travel out of state in order to get an abortion, we will pay for you. But I also want to caution that just just to give some perspective here, that doesn't solve the problem. Right. And also, there are a lot of women who will not be comfortable having to tell their employers, look, look, I'm, I, I need to go to California because I need to get an abortion. Well, yeah, I mean, um, you, you live in a state where now that puts your company, <laughs> makes your company liable. Yeah. Your boss, yeah. your CEO could... Uh, uh, be hunted down in, in Texas. Uh, and the, you know, you oh, yeah. start by saying that people in chat were surprised, like, oh, there's a bounty program. This is how this whole thing started. There is, you know, $10,000. Like, it turns everyone in, in the state of Texas into the secret police, to the, the Stasi yeah. from, from. Well, not even just Texas. You yeah. don't have to be a citizen. Right. You're right. To, to You're sue right. somebody for this. Right. And so, and it's like, yeah, like now you have the grounds to sue somebody. It's, um, yeah, no one's coming to help us. We've got to help each other. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, again, this is on gamespeed.com. Uh, read it. It's important to share it. Uh, share with people that you think can make a difference. Uh, thank you for that, Rachel. Uh, let's uh, let's see. Let's get to the question of the day. What did I have here? I had... Um, okay, yes. Have you played or do you plan on, uh, to try any Netflix games through its mobile app? The Impossible Pivot. We just did it. Uh, Rachel, I, need, I forgot to get this up while I do that. Do, do you, have you played any? Like, Have you played Point B, which is a game people pointed me to? That is available through your Netflix subscription if you have the mobile app. Uh, have you, or, or does that even sound interesting to you at all? Oh no, I have way too many games <laughs> to, to start playing games on Netflix too. I was pretty. Uh, I was 
was amused when I was watching the Netflix Geek Week and they were revealing all their games and they got to Queen's Gambit and they're like, hey, look at all this this cool mobile game we got based on the Queen's Gambit. And I'm like, okay, cool. What is it? And my, my husband and I were watching. And I was like, it's chess. <laughs> Y'all made chess. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. Um, Although I will say out of all of them, I will probably play chess. Yeah. I, I, I mean... Getting um uh the the uh, uh the the game that they just announced last week um into the breach like to me that oh, yeah yeah that sounds uh very cool that sounds like a um a cool thing to be like okay now we can have that in mobile Netflix is paying to make sure that we uh you know we we get that without the um ads without a bunch of microtransactions to make it make sense and also it's just included in a subscription I already have so I'm like that sounds good to me um. But you know what? I'm trying to see. Did I did I ever even post this? Maybe I never even posted this. Okay, so um, you know what? That that's fine. Over the weekend doesn't make a lot of sense anyhow. Let's just post. That. Well, that's one we'll post today, and I'll uh, I'll save this question next question for the next uh, next time. Um, all right, that sounds good. So we'll ask that question again. If you're gonna play uh, Netflix uh, games through the app, if you plan to do that, if you've ever done that, um, I'm I'm pretty I'm still pretty. Uh, Excited to have Into the Breach on mobile, but I, I keep telling myself that, and then I know I'm probably just going to end up playing it on Switch or Steam Deck or somewhere else. That just makes sense for me to have a game in front of me. Um, all right. Uh, that's That pretty much does it for Game Mess Mornings here on Giant Bomb today. Uh, Giant Bomb, we have a, another stacked week. We'll have a bunch of stuff going up. Um, I'm about to go into a meeting right now to discuss exactly what's happening but we'll have the bombcast tomorrow. We'll have Game Mess Mornings on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I'll we'll probably have a pretty similar schedule to what I had last week in terms of guests. Um, I believe Lucy will be on Wednesday, Jan will be on, on Thursday, and Tam will be on Friday. That's subject to change. We'll see. Um, we'll do a voicemail dump track on Thursday, all, all stuff like that. And then we're we're looking to start a couple other things. So keep your eyes open. Put up a couple quick looks. All that stuff will be on the upcoming on uh, giantbob.com. Rachel, what do you have going on? Um, well, this week we've got a lot of, um, well, I'm going to be watching the Nintendo Direct tomorrow, yes. apparently. And actually, I should try and stream it. That would be fun. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Especially especially if they reveal some Metroid. I think that'll be fun. Yeah. But yeah, if you follow me on Twitter, you can get all my uh, game opinions. I also do I also do a personal blog on some other stuff. You might know it. It's like Golden Girls and Perry Mason, that sort of thing. <laughs> but yeah, I'm also getting back into streaming. So links to that will be on my Twitter. So uh, just follow me on Twitter at Rachel Kayser. At Rachel Kayser. Awesome. All right. With that, we are going to get out of here. And uh, as always... Have a good one. Take care of yourself and goodbye as we fade to black. Bye, everybody.